Ladies and gentlemen, on this YouTube channel, I oftentimes will feature chess in the form of great success. Uh, that rhymed. Wow, I should be a uh, should be a poet. I'm talking grandmaster games or lower rated games where you defeat somebody or accomplish something monumental. But in this video, I am sharing the story of how I reached my absolute pinnacle in my chess career, and then I quit and I lost it all. Uh, and I quit chess a few times in my life. Uh, I quit it when I was maybe 15, 16 for several years. I, uh, and, and you know, I just have times where I don't want to play. Uh, but I've never truly quit, as in, like, never thinking about it or observing big tournaments or something like that, because this idiotic board game is the only thing that I have going for me, and nowadays it's probably not going to be so easy to quit. So, this video is split into a couple of parts, timestamps on the video player, you're free to jump around. The year is 2018. The month is July. I have scheduled six tournaments to play in the summer of 2018 to fulfill my international master title, and I succeeded on the very first tournament. I actually got the IM title. So this is the second one. I am playing with House Money, and this video against, uh, sorry, this game against Emilio Cordova, very strong grandmaster from Peru, is actually one of my videos called the best game I ever played. So I'm not gonna cover it in great detail, but I played a wild opening. Uh, I really caught Emilio off guard, and we had, and his rating is 2630 uh, at the time of this game. We have an absolutely wild game, as you can already see. I mean, I've lost the right to castle. I have a mass of pawns in the center. He's attacking me from all three sides of the board, but somehow my position is extremely resilient. And as we get to around move 15, it, it, it becomes quite clear that white has certain difficulties here. Uh, and um, this, is, uh, th this is where I completely took over this game, and I played one of my favorite moves to this day, uh, which is the move h5. The point of this move is to rook lift into the game and basically tip the balance of active forces. Right now, both of us have a good amount of pieces out, but only one of us is going to be able to kind of make the next step in the position, and that was me. Uh, I played a really offbeat opening. I immediately swarmed my opponent with my rooks, ready to chop down in the middle and kind of bring them over here to create an attack, all while there's just a cage built in the center that's preventing any of his pieces from moving. And when, uh, when actually all of our forces began clashing, you see that his pieces die off. And I still have everything out, right? So he tries to kind of trade and he tries to run his king to safety and activate his rook and kind of consolidate. Uh, but, I, but I immediately keep up the pressure uh, and, I, and I start preventing any of his pieces from escaping jail. Uh, and again, the reason I'm kind of going fast through this game and you're like, hey, I've never seen this before. Okay, well, watch this video, have a good time, and then go watch my video called The Best Game I Ever Played. I don't like to make repeat content. I really get embarrassed when I do that. Um, the synopsis of this game is uh, I absolutely manhunted Emilio's king. Bishop to a4 is the final, uh, bishop to c6, bishop to a4 is the final threat of this game. Look at his king. It's completely surrounded. Like, it has absolutely no way to escape the assault that's coming. If he goes back to d1, I chop down his knight and I mate him in the center of the board. Uh, this guy is rated 2630. He's an extremely strong player. And I basically made him play without three pieces for this game. And I won. Bishop to c6. He resigned. Uh, and this was the highest rated player I ever beat. And after winning this game, this was the highest ever rating I ever had, which is 2431. And like I said, this is my second tournament of 2018 in the summer. Were you paying attention? From this point forward, and I wanted to introduce this video with kind of this beautiful win, beautiful, almost flawless victory. I was at the peak of my powers. And then it all started to fall apart. And the first thing that I would like to show you uh, is this tournament that I played in Montreal. This is actually the final round of the tournament. The tournament's not going so horribly. It was an I am Norm Round Robin tournament, so I had signed up for it because I just, you know, I, Got a kind of a free, a free opportunity to go to Montreal, hang out, play some strong uh, Canadian junior players. And I was playing against uh, Olivier Kenta Chikurate. I don't know if I'm supposed to pronounce it like that. Maybe his name is just basically Oliver, but French. Um, but yeah, Olivier. And he's, uh, he's obviously a good player. He's now rated like 2400. This is the final round. So the tournament's like not so bad. I've lost maybe five points. And I know he's a very solid D4 player. It's the final round. I want to end on a good note. I want to play aggressively. I want to, you know, obviously I'm higher rated. I should, I should push the fight to him. So I go for a Dutch defense, right? I, back in the day, I was, I was kind of messing around with the Dutch. He plays just a very, he's a mainline kind of guy. So he, he just plays like the standard universal Dutch setup. Uh, and I was having big difficulties before this game and throughout this whole tournament, figuring out what to play against my opponents because I was 24-20 officially. 
Uh, and he, and the field of players was like 2,300, high 2,200. And I, and I just didn't know how much risk I was supposed to take against them. I was trying to kind of win every game, but it sort of backfired because I was playing some stupid openings. So I went for E6. E6 is not a move. The main lines in the Dutch are C6, Knight C6, and Queen E8. Um, and E6 is a very provocative move because you allow your opponent to play the standard advance D5 and try to play for E4. But, you know, Olivier played, like, solidly. He played, he played D5 when he was supposed to. I brought my knight to B4 attacking his queen uh, and then rotated my knight around to C5. And this is all fine. Everything up until this point, I knew. I get my knight to C5, I recapture his pawn on E6, and life goes on. But we got to this position and I made a very big mistake. I started thinking on my own and I tried reinventing the wheel. Basically, I was like, well, if I play bishop to e6, he's gonna go here, and I don't really know what my next move is, because now his game plan is very simple. He will finish his development, bring his rooks to the middle, maybe go for knight g5, attacking my e6 bishop, and try to, you know, pressure me with this light squared bishop, maybe crack the center open with e4. I also thought about taking with a knight, but then I was like, why did I move my knight there, 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 there. Like, what am I, like, wh what, who am I trying to impress? Oh, look at me! I know how the horsey moves! That's why they gave me the International Master title! I, so I, I thought of an idea here, and I calculated for a bit, and the idea began with the move h6. So I was gonna, this pawn's not going anywhere, right? And now he doesn't ever have knight to g5, and I calculated, okay, if he goes knight h4 and attacks my weakness, that's not a problem, I play king h7. And maybe if he cracks open the center after that, we trade everything. I'll just win this pawn back. Okay, h6. He played knight h4, I played king h7, he played e4. So now it's basically, I'm calculating, you're calculating, someone's calculating wrong. Or maybe we're both calculating right and we're both happy, but that usually doesn't happen in chess. So, he plays the move e4 and begins kind of mauling the center of the board. Uh, takes, 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 right? We're just kind of going on this big exchange. Takes, 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 etc., etc. And in my mind, I had calculated that obviously, like any normal person, he would play queen takes e4 in this position. Because, duh, right? I mean, queen e4, obviously. Uh, and then I, in this position, I would play queen f6 or, or, or some move. I don't know, some move. And the point is that this pawn will die anyway. Like, queen f6 and the pawn will die. I don't know, e7, rook e8, right? And then I have two bishops. I'm very happy. So that's what I had calculated in advance all the way back here. It's like h6, knight h4, we have a big trade. He takes on e4, I play queen f6. Okay? We get to this position. Olivier plays knight takes g6. Which was a shock, <laughs> to say the least. Um, I was like, what? So this move is the refutation of the entire move h6. And then you ask Gotham, you could have taken back this pawn that he had just taken from you with two different pieces and you chose instead to play h6. I know, I know it's gonna be a very depressing video, but it's gonna be hilarious. You'll get to laugh at my pain. There were some wild variations here, um, like uh, after the move e4. I, I mean, I'm not even sure exactly what I missed, but he had all sorts of tricks with like pushing this pawn to e7. Like, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know what I thought I was going to play here to be, to be quite honest with you. I, I, I don't know what I was expecting to go differently. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> what, what, what to say? Maybe rook f6, I thought I was gonna play here, but then there's just e7, so I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I would love to tell you what I missed, but I have no idea. And Olivier hunted my king down, uh, and, uh, pushed his pawn, and then played another very disgusting move, which was bishop takes h6. And I had to take, and he played rook e4, and I resigned, because there's no way to stop this! and then mate in a variety of different ways. I can play queen to h3, he will take my rook, and then he will win my queen, and it's very, very painful, and I die. So, uh, yeah, this is how I ended my tournament uh, after rookie form in Montreal. I lost uh, some 12, 13 points, uh, but I figured, okay, you know, that's not a big deal. Let's put this behind us. Of course, it hurts to lose the tournament. Now we are playing the next tournament, which we had signed up for, two tournaments in August. Uh, of 2018. This is the U.S. Masters. Very prestigious tournament. Many, many strong grand masters. We are playing against a 2000 in the first round. <coughs> Austin's a good player. Um, actually, uh, a friend of mine played him recently as well in a tournament. And, you know, I saw that actually Austin himself plays the Dutch. It's like the Spider-Man meme. So I decided, you know, it's my first official game as an international master title. If you notice, by the way, if anybody's been confused, I haven't gotten my title approved here yet. That's actually correct. 
Were you watching and you were like, oh, that's wrong? No, I was in FM. This is my first official confirmed game as an IM. And I'm like, okay, I'm playing a guy who's playing the Dutch. Let's play some weird aggressive sideline. Let's play C3, H4. And put our knight on H3 and put our queen on B3. And you know why I did this? I drew inspiration from Ilya Nizhnik, who, when I played the US Masters and played the Dutch against him, played in a similar way against me. And he crushed me. So I was like, well, if Nizhnik can do it, I can do it too. So let's see, let, let's see what happens. Uh, well, um, you know, Austin plays very principled. He plays directly in the center of the board. I trade, try to checkmate him, and, you know, I'm creating some bishop c5 ideas with queen to f7, and I'm gonna get my knight out on long castle. It's gonna be a big aggressive game. And here, Austin dumped a cold bucket of water on my head by playing the move knight to d8. It's just a weird move, like move 10, ba random backward knight move to where the queen once was. And yet, with one move, my entire position just is idiotic. Like, my knight is out here doing nothing, his pawns dominate the center, he will kick me out, and proceed to just launch all his pieces forward at my two stupid bishops, right? So I finish my development, he kicks me out, and at this point on move 12, Austin is just much better. Like, he, he's just much better. I mean, I just completely missed this knight d8 idea in the opening. I was way too exotic for my own good. He begins creating an initiative. So he now has kicked me out, and all my forces are arranged in a really stupid formation. So what is he going to do? Well, I give him a check, and I hope to God that here he blocks and allows me to repeat moves. Because I'm 370 points higher rated than him, right? That's the only advantage I have right now. And he does. He allows me to repeat moves. Oh, thank God. Because if he didn't, if Austin played the move c6, let's just quickly take stock of this position. Black is so much better. For example, if I just fulfill my destiny by playing short castle, a long castle, he will play short castle. What's my next move? If I play h5, he will play g5 and f4. That's horrible. He will win my f2 pawn. So I can't play h5. What can I play? What moves do I have? Where am I moving any of my pieces? Pause here and try to find a move. Bishop d2, he takes this. Okay, I'll play rook f1 so I can move my bishop. And then what? He'll play knight f7. He'll bring his pawns forward on the queen side. I mean, I just legit have no moves. The computer hates this position for white. So luckily, I'm able to bail out in the US Masters with a round one draw. Okay, okay, let's shake it off. We've lost some rating, but it's not a problem. It's not a problem. We start to win a few games. We piece together a couple of decent results, and we find ourselves playing Grandmaster Sam Savion. This guy's a real, he's a strong player, right? This is like somewhere around five or six in the tournament, and uh, I know he's going to play in English. He had been playing it, right? So I play a, an interesting thing. I play h6. h6 chooses to wait for White's next move. White might play knight to c3, allowing me to kind of put some pressure. Vladimir Kramnik played this move against Magnus Carlsen, all right? Now, I'm not Kramnik, dare I say, or, or, or Carlsen played it against Kramnik, but that was the game that inspired me right before this. And I've actually played this line uh, since. I played it against Kirilla in Vegas 2019, I think. Um, and Savion, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't play the critical way. He just, he just fianchettos both bishops and just plays in the center of the board, just kind of playing normal moves. So we get out of the opening and life is good for me. I mean, I kind of got a completely normal position, right? At least one would think. Bishop c5 is maybe not the best move. Uh, and here I, I probably should play for d5 just in general. Like uh, you, sh you should be trying to put two pawns in the center. Um, c6, d5 is probably the best way to go. Uh, but you know, I play like seemingly normal moves. I play bishop g4, he plays knight e2, kicks me out, all right. But right here, Sam makes kind of a lunge forward into my position, right? And I got a little thrown off because I was thinking like, well, if I let him take me, that's unpleasant. So I'm going to take. But this is a bit annoying because he has this pressure on the C file and he's going to go for D4. So what do I do, right? What do I do? Well, Sam goes for D4. Now, obviously, I shouldn't take, right? Because if I take, I undouble his pawns. I allow him to transfer a knight forward into the position. Uh, and, uh, I have no, no play of my own after that, because he also controls my c6 break, right? I obviously should play something like bishop b6. If we play takes, takes, and bishop takes on e5, I'll play rook d8, and I create counterplay against this pawn. That seems, that seems to make some sense to me. Obviously, he can defend, but, okay, life goes on. But I take, he comes forward, I back up, he castles, and I try to trade knights with him. And he just backs up. And I sit there for a moment going, I have no moves. He controls my pawn break here. He's going, he, he's going to run me over with his pawns very soon. 
I just have no targets. I have no targets and a very bad pawn structure. And would you believe? Five, six moves later, I resigned. Six moves later. He moved his king out of the way of my bishop and knight. Right? I'm trying to prepare some stuff. He goes knight f4. He goes e4, kicks my knight out. He goes knight h5, attacking my g7 pawn with his bishop. I try to block in a very feeble way, and queen g4. I'm basically getting mated. I try to defend. He sacrifices his knight to open up my position and plays queen e6, and the game is over. Because if I play king g7, king h8, he takes and it's mate, and I can go here and delay mate for a couple moves by literally sacrificing all of my pieces to prevent getting mated. And I still get mated, by the way. <laughs> I still get mated. I got absolutely demolished. And just like in the last tournament, I lost my final game of this tournament also to Justin Sarkar, who's a strong I am. He actually has uh, all his GM norms, but he, has, he doesn't have the rating. His rating has kind of fallen over the years, but he's extremely strong. And I actually don't have that game. That game wasn't in the database. Otherwise, I would have shown that game. Instead, I showed another game where Sam Savion picked me up, threw me across the room, and proceeded to dump like five chess, uh, chess sets just directly on my face. That's the, that's the way chess nerds beat each other up, by dumping chess pieces on one another. I lost some more rating in this tournament as well, and it was a really, really bad tournament. Um, and uh, I, uh, I was going to end my summer with, uh, with a trip down to Texas called the Southwest Open. That was originally what I had booked. Now, at some point, some of you might be going, yo, why didn't you just stop when you hit the IM title? Well, we're going to talk about that at the end, obviously. Uh, that's where I'm going to have my heart-to-heart -heart with you. Uh, but uh, the short answer to that is I never really even thought I would hit this title, if I'm being completely honest with you. So being at 2430, and I am, I was like, well, screw it. I already won a bun of, bunch of money. Now I'm in this casino already for the next few days. Let me continue to play. Maybe something good will happen. Something good did not happen. So we travel down to the Southwest Open. Uh, this is a tournament being held in somewhere in Texas. Somewhere in Texas. I don't know. Texas is enormous. One of my earlier rounds in this tournament, I'm playing against uh, Anish, not Giri. Uh, slightly, you know, like Walmart Anish, uh, Vivekananthan. He's a really good player, though. Nowadays, he's like 2350 FM. But back then, he was like a 2100. I didn't know who he was. And I played a Trumpowski, which was one of the openings that I, I used to play back in the day, which wasn't a main line. And we, we kind of left theory very early. He played in a very odd way. He just kind of developed his pieces like this. Um, not something I had been used to. Like, normally, you're supposed to be a bishop here. Your knight goes to F6. But... He played pretty solid in the opening, and uh, we both castled and brought our pieces, and this was the position. Now, if you're 2400, and you're an IM, and you have any respect whatsoever, you will beat any 2300 or lower from this position. White just has a very comfortable board situation. Black has some sort of weird piece set up and no real pawn play. Like, white has the center, so white can focus on the center of the board. And that's what I was trying to do. I played, like, bishop d3, trying to trying to trade his bishop, kind of advance in the center, maybe pressure on the c file in the future, put a knight on c5, like this. And here, Anish played b5, which is a terrible anti-positional move. And when I study some of my old games, I want to vomit because of how little I would take advantage of these kind of mistakes. So the best line here for white is at some point, to just pressure the queen side by trading off some pieces. Like, this is the professional solution. You take, take, and because black has weakened the queen side so much, you are never worried about moves like before, because you can just play knight d5 and this knight is hanging. And nobody can protect it, by the way. Nobody can protect it. The knight has to move, and if it goes to a5, well, we take, and at some point we're going to take on c7. Like, if black tries to hang around, we have even, like, rook, rook a1. So just too many weaknesses have been created, right? And because of the early damaging of the structure, which is common for the Trumpowski, this D pawn will just queen once we win the C7 pawn. Very simple positional play, right? But here I played a horrible move. Like a move that I should be, I, I should be beaten with. Like if I was a Singaporean citizen and I played this move and they saw it, the Chess Federation would have a very stern talking to with me. Almost as bad as chewing gum in Singapore. I played B4, which is so idiotic. I don't know what I was thinking. B4 literally plays directly into Black's plans. He traded and played A5, and now all the tactics on the queen side work in his favor, to the point that even though he equalized, a move later, I am losing in this position. Because I take on E5 and he doesn't take back here. He has to play queen B5, just leaving my knight out to die. I'm like almost lost here, because what ends up happening in, in all the tactics 
is he just wins my pawn. He's just a clean pawn up. And if I do something like a4, then he can take it. But even if he does something like this, he has just a, a, a protected pawn. And he's going to go after this. We're talking about a talented kid, but he's 2100. He's 2100 and he just played b5, right? Again, if I have any self-respect as a strong international master looking to climb to GM, but I just, I mean, it's just, I just played horribly. And he, luckily, did, he didn't find queen b5. Instead, he took like this. And we, we went for a, for a very interesting endgame where I had rook and, like, I guess a pawn. Because he's about to win one of my pawns. Rook and a pawn for a bishop. And I thought I'm going to put some pressure on him here. The position is completely equal, actually. And, you know, I, I did not have to give him a second pawn. I could have played g3. I didn't want to because I thought he was going to maybe cut my king off. And I really didn't like how that looked. So for an inexplicable reason, I give him a second pawn, thinking that I guess I'm going to trap his bishop and go for c7. But he just does this. And I have no winning chances here. Even though I have a passed pawn and a rook, he's defending everything. He blocks my pawn. He brings his king. I can't remove his bishop and his king from one another. So I'm like, okay, let's just take the draw. Let's just... But he declines the draw, and now he's playing for a win. And as the endgame continues, he just, he, he, he doesn't want to draw. He just keeps playing, realizing that he has the passers. <laughs> I think you see what's happening here. What's going to happen is his pawns are going to make it down the entire length of the board. And they do. And for a long time, maybe the engine could have held this. Uh, I didn't, because I'm, I'm terrible. I let him block his king, my rook, from seeing his king. And, well, I lost. I, I, I lost for almost no good reason. And obviously, I was already feeling very down uh, during this tournament. But the final game that I'm going to show you, this game was the game that made me quit. And that game is against a player that some of you, if you've been following my tournaments recently, know. I played this gentleman about a week ago in a tournament. And uh, his name is Balaji Dagupani. At the time of this game, I don't know, maybe he's 14, 13, 13 or 14. He's like 2200, obviously strong, climbing the ranks. And I go for one of the only times in my life I play a ready. And it's because I kind of predicted what he would play. Uh, so I got, a, I got a pretty comfortable position from the opening. Uh, this is maybe round eight or seven. So this is not the last round of the tournament, but this is uh, one of the last rounds. And my position is very active. So I have, I have pressure on his center early on. I have two center pawns versus one. I have opportunities to kind of push his pieces back if, I'm, if I do this the right way. Because his setup with the knights is just a little non-standard. His knights are supposed to be in the middle, like mine, but his knights are sort of back. And that allows me to either put some pressure on his isolated pawn if I create one, or try to push up the middle. And what I do in this game is I try to push up the middle. Uh, computer isn't like, you know, it doesn't give me its full blessing, but this is what I go for trying to play against this very bad bishop. It's a very interesting position, very dynamic game. Bishop e3, he brings the bishop back to f7. Um, and he, he starts creating counterplay on the queen side. Kind of logical, because he's sort of overrun in the middle, and he's sort of overrun on the king side. But we, we have a very, you know, it's a very interesting game. I mean, what can I say? It's a confrontational battle. He, uh, rook, rook a7 is a weird move. And right around here, I began taking over the initiative. He probably should. It's very tough for black to make a move, though. I mean, a4, I don't know. I was even thinking to try to lock everything, or even take. Like, so what? Okay, a4, big deal. I just take on a4, right? He would probably have to try to play for this. Um, but he sort of froze his position. So he took his foot off the gas, and he allowed me to build up on the king side, ready for g5, build up my bishop. My knight is beautiful. My rook is beautiful. My queen sees, like, full diagonals length of the board. And around here, I began sort of swarming. Uh, I, I, I picked up a pawn, and he started creating some counterplay. Uh, we started, you know, trading a few pieces, and I was like, okay, at a certain moment, he's just gonna, I'm gonna play g5. So there it is, and that doesn't look very easy to deal with at all, although if you let Stockfish deal with it, Stockfish will deal with it. So uh, I switched the action over, and I transformed the position into just being a clean pawn up, right, with my king safe, and he, uh, he, he stuck around. He tried to, like, block everything up, and then, and then gave me his a pawn on the queen side to bring in his rooks, and it, to bring in his rook. It's a little difficult for me to win this because my pieces have to be passive and guarding my king. He's got like queen f1, bishop d5, not right away, but obviously you can tell that for the cost of uh, two pawns, uh, he has gotten some activity. So I tried to spend the remainder of this game finding a way to consolidate and not lose. Uh, and uh, 
actually I was failing because the computer was finding some absurd ways for him to hold. Uh, but from a human standpoint, you're just down two pawns and you don't actually have any threats. You're down two pawns and you're just not letting your opponent move. There's a difference between between actually creating threats and not letting your opponent move. So at some point I was confident he would mess up and I would be able to escape. And at some point that did happen. He got a little bit too close. I gave a few checks and now I'm ready to kind of break out of this bind. And I do. A couple moves later I find rook e3. So now he is forced to trade with me and the game is over. Right? Very easy. How do you win this game? You can push your A pawn all the way down, and that's it. Now, keep in mind, we have about a minute each here. So I'm like, all right, Balaji, go ahead and take my pawn. It arrives on A7. Your bishop will never touch it. And at some point, I will just get rid of your bishop, check you, and make a queen. Balaji goes bishop D5, white to play and win. Finishing touches on a very nice game. Queen E8 check. King G7 only move. And now, not queening... Not queening because you can get mated yourself despite being up a queen. And that's what actually I was worried about. I was worried about blundering something like that. You don't do that. You give a check and you pin the bishop to the queen. So when the king goes to the back rank, now you queen with check. Bishop takes, you take the queen, Balaji resigns. We don't quit chess, we don't make this video. Butterfly effect, maybe I'm a zookeeper in that timeline. But I played this, gave him a few more checks, and found a way to queen with check and win his bishop. I missed the fact that I could pin his bishop to this queen and go for the idea. I only had a minute on my clock, but I was fully confident that I have a bishop. Do you see this? He does not possess one of those. I was like, I'm up a bishop. I obviously should be winning this game. But as I was giving him a myriad of checks, as we crossed the 70th move threshold and his queen just kind of stayed put, harassing my king constantly, threatening perpetual check, I began realizing, I'm not winning this game at all. I am not winning this game at all. And Balaji very confidently just kept his queen active, brought his king over to his pawns. There's no win. And the worst part is, even if I go for this end game, I have an H pawn. It's the wrong color corner. So this is a draw. He can lose both these pawns and he, well, he has to lose it and make sure this is an H pawn. And it's a draw. And on move 90 of this game, 89, we agree to a draw. Because I can't win. You can't win queen and bishop versus queen. It's impossible. So I had made a nine, and I blew it. And this game was the final straw. Once I drew this game, I had lost about 60 points, 64, 63, since becoming a 2430 unofficially rated IM after I beat Cordova. The craziest part is after this game, I quit chess for maybe seven months. I didn't play a single tournament for seven months. And when I came back, I lost another 20. I lost another 20 points. I was losing to lower rated players, as you can see. I was getting outplayed by GMs. Cordova was the last GM that I beat in a very long time. I, uh, I, I, maybe I've won a game? Yeah, I mean, I think I've beaten one GM since I beat Cordova over the board. So it's been like two and a half, maybe three years. Um, and since becoming 2430, since I completed my most recent tournament uh, in, uh, in 2022 in January, I am now 100 points lower rated than I once was. Now, a couple of things are, if I actually go through each individual game that I played coming up and coming back down, a couple of things remain consistent. I have a very wild playing style and sometimes unpredictable with my openings for my opponent, for myself. And sometimes you get lucky, you catch someone in prep they don't know, like I got Cordova and we had a back and forth fight. He missed a chance to take an advantage and the rest of the game was all me. But you also have the flip side. You have the side of when you run up really hot, you get red hot, you catch everybody in the openings that you're, you're comfortable in and they're not. But you also have the opposite, where you don't know the openings, your confidence is much lower that way, and you overthink. And I don't have a full explanation of why I went all the way up and then immediately went all the way back down. But I do always say I never even thought, and maybe I should change my mindset, but I never even thought I would become an IM in the first place. Because I was a 19-year-old rated 2200. Kids are like seven nowadays rated 2200. So I've always had a kind of love-hate relationship with competitive chess. I've always come back, gone away, come back. And um, when I hit IM, I must have just had an enormous adrenaline dump. And I just kind of went, eh, I never thought I'd be GM anyway. And that level of 2430 to go up, to push even higher, I was nowhere near that level. And I think my player returned back to the mean. I think my strength... It's probably that of a high 2300 rated player. That's being honest. My opening preparation, 
Um, when I get my prep on the board, maybe we go into the 24s. When I don't, we go into the low 23s. Everything from mental endurance to calculation to openings. And if I ever want to get back to that level of 2430 and above, well, I, my openings need work. My psychology needs work. Uh, and uh, my calculation definitely needs work. As we can see in some of these games, there were chances missed for both of us and um, overconfidence and, uh, and you name it. But I wanted to share this video because I don't share a lot of videos of kind of uh, defeat, constant defeat. And uh, yeah, it's not easy. Let me tell you, it's definitely not easy. And it's a little bit embarrassing to look at my ratings sometimes as like this 2330 rated I am. Like I'm closer to the lower title than I am to the higher one. But I've been there. I've been at the heights and hopefully we'll get back there someday.